Every great story begins with the hero in a dilemma. And then at some point, he experiences a turnaround that becomes transformative in his life and he goes back and he deals with whatever challenge he was experiencing. It's called the hero's journey. And if you look through the years, you'll see that outline over and over again in our stories. I mention that to you because I came to a turning point like that in my own life a number of years ago. And it happened just outside of London, England. Now, in order to tell you that story, I need to back up just a little bit and tell you uh, a little bit to kind of ramp up and tell you what happened in London, England. In the mid-1990s, Union Baptist Association entered into a partnership with the Chinese Baptist Convention in Taiwan. And over and over again, I had the opportunity of leading groups over to Taiwan and ministering there. And just kind of a, a bit of a, an aside, Jason Lee was one of our uh, key pastors then uh, that was part of that partnership. He's a native of Taiwan. And uh, Jason accompanied me on every one of those trips just about. Uh, he is headed back to Taiwan because his mother-in-law uh, passed away and he and his wife and family are headed over to Taiwan for uh, the funeral service, so I would ask you to remember Jason. But while we were involved in that partnership over and over again, I had the opportunity of, of seeing missions firsthand there on the mission field. And in the process, realized that missionaries think a little bit differently in their task than we do in our task as pastors and, and church leaders. On that last trip... Uh, Jim Harrington and I were over there. Uh, we were finishing up. It was just the two of us. We were there to do some training. And it was on that trip that Jim, who was then the executive director of UBA, said to me uh, in a restaurant there on the harbor in Hong Kong, as we l looked out over the harbor and, and saw the lights, the beauty of, of Hong Kong, he said, uh, Tom, when I get back, uh, to Houston, I plan to resign, and I'm going to head a program called Mission Houston. And he said, you're probably going to be asked to be the interim. They may ask you to be the executive director, don't know. But that began a, a process for me. It was, it was really unexpected. And uh, Jim and I then went from Hong Kong over to Taipei. We did training for missionaries there for uh, about three or four days. He headed on back to Houston, and I stayed there for another week because I was speaking at a, a closing rally. I was there all by myself for about a week. And it was while I was there that I went out early one morning uh, because, you know, 12, 14-hour time change, body doesn't quite adjust. So about two o'clock in the morning, I'm out walking around the track at the University of Taipei. And as I'm walking around that track, it was in that setting that I realized if I was coming back to this job, I needed to learn how to think like a missionary. And I had absolutely no idea how to do that. I knew that Houston was growing, Houston was changing, Houston was diverse, Houston was multicultural, Houston was all of these things. And I had really no idea how to lead an association to work in that kind of environment. And so I realized I needed to learn how to think like a missionary. I came back, I was asked to be the interim, and, uh, you know, a few months into the process, Jerry Rankin from the International Mission Board came to Houston for an appointment service, came to the office, we sat down, we talked, and as he was getting ready to leave, one of those throwaway comments, standing at the door uh, of my office, as he was getting ready to go out, he said, Tom, is there anything that I can do for you? And I, I smiled and said, yeah, you can teach me how to think like a missionary. Because I don't know, and you guys are the experts, so I need you to teach me how to think like a missionary. 
And Jerry Rankin was gracious and said, sure, we'll do that. You need to talk to so-and-so. I'll have him get in contact with you. And I know how it is with busy folks. I know how it is sometimes with me. You know, we forget to, to do those things. And he somehow forgot to make that contact. And things just kind of slid on for a while. I moved into the position of executive director. And it was 2002 in November that I heard about a meeting that was taking place in London, England. They had invited the directors of missions of the largest associations all across the convention to go to London, England, and there to be trained by the International Mission Board in how to think like a missionary. And I realized, one, if I'd gotten an invitation, I threw it away. But the likelihood is, I was never invited to that meeting. And so uh, I found out uh, about this through a conversation with some guys up in Dallas. I came back home. I got on the telephone. I called the North American Mission Board. I asked who was in charge of that meeting. And they told me uh, who was in charge of that meeting. I asked for their number. I called them and said, hi, I'm Tom Billings. And I understand you've got a meeting to teach folks how to think like missionaries. And it's going to take place in London, England in just a couple of days. Is that true? And they said, yeah. I said, have you got any openings? And they said, well, we've got two. I said, good, I'll take it. And, you know, it was kind of this long pause. And then, well, okay. So somebody was having a party and I wasn't invited. So I just invited myself to the party. And so uh, I hop on a plane. This month, 10 years ago, to head to London, England. Now, I thought I was going to London. And when you go to London, you think of some of the iconic images, you know, the, the tube, the underground, you, uh, Buckingham Palace and, and, and the changing of the guards, or, or, you know, Parliament and Big Ben and the River Thames. No, I get off of the airplane and I get in a cab and I take a 40-mile ride outside of London to a little place, uh, this place right here, uh, that was built hundreds of years ago, that was originally owned by a knight uh, of the Knights Templar, who actually brought back seed from one of his crusades and planted cedar trees there. So we've got cedars of Lebanon that actually are growing there. But this is way, way out from London. I mean, it was out where the sheep are literally walking up and down the pathway, blocking the cars, and you've got to wait for the sheep to get out of the way. I was there at a place called St. Catherine's in Parmore. It's called something on the Thames, but I've discovered everything in London is called on the Thames, no matter how far away it is from the water. And it was in that setting that I went with a group of about 12 people, and some folks from the International Mission Board, folks from the North American Mission Board, and I met a fellow by the name of Jim Slack, a fellow who uh, some of you have heard and know. But Jim is a missionary, and he was responsible for training missionaries. He's trained thousands of missionaries for the International Mission Board, and he was there to serve as our trainer. And it was while I was in that meeting that I learned something about myself, and I made a decision that really became a turning point that has changed everything really about the direction of UBA. As Jim was talking that first day, I'll, I'll never forget it. Uh, Jim is a, a diminutive fellow in terms of stature, but he has a voice that is outsized for his body, and so he speaks loudly and with great force. He, he needs no microphone in any environment. And as he began to speak, he would tell the story, and he told the story of Luke chapter 15 and the parable of the lost sheep. And you and I know that parable. And as he told that parable, he's telling it, and there's a crack in his voice, and a tear forms in the corner of his eye as he begins to talk about that one lost sheep. And I realized, as I was listening to him, that this is a man who was broken-hearted for lost folks. And then he, he asked the question, 
You know, where was the priority for Jesus? You know, he had 99 in the fold and he had one lost sheep. And where was his priority? And his priority was on the one lost sheep. And he left everything to go for that one lost sheep. And as Jim started talking about that, and I heard the break in his voice, the tears really started to flow when he said, and where's the priority for us as a church? He said, it seems like the numbers are reversed. We've got the one, but the 99 are out there and they're lost. And as he told that, and as he did it in his broken voice, I realized something was breaking inside of me. I realized to my dismay that somewhere along the way, something happened between the time I first was saved and called to the ministry as a 16-year-old young boy. And now I was, you know, many, many years and many, many degrees further on down the line. But somewhere along the way, I had become a professional Christian. I was the guy who knew all the right answers and I knew all the right formulas and I could teach all of the programs. But somewhere along the way, passion had given way to professionalism. And ministry had become a job. Christianity had become a way of making a living more than a way of living a life. And when I realized that had happened to me, I would go up every evening. We were there for almost three weeks. I'd go up every evening to my room. I was in an area, in a room, all by myself. And I became brokenhearted over reaching the lost. God began to do something inside of me. And I realized, you know, I was learning some things about how to think, but it wasn't so much about how to think as it was about what I felt. And when I came back, I came back and I began to share with the staff some of the things that I was learning. And in the process of doing that, I'll never forget James Furr, who was on our staff at that time. James came up and said, Tom, I don't know what happened, but you're different. And as we began to share and we began to talk as a staff about what it means for us to live in this city and to, to take our churches and to lead our churches to reach this city with the gospel of Christ, then we as an association began to change. Yeah. When I moved into this position, I was part of a team that helped craft and create the statement that kind of defined who we are. We, as an association said, we were healthy, growing churches, cooperating to transform our communities, Houston, and the world. And the emphasis was on healthy and growing churches. But as we came back, we began to shift what we were doing. We said, we need to understand our city better. And that's when we began to take research really, really seriously in UVA. More so than ever before. We'd already initiated the Houston Profile Project, working with Mission Houston and Baylor University to try and get an idea of who lived here in the city. That's when we began to identify people groups and language that we use and numbers that we toss out so freely now. We didn't have then when we talk about, you know, hundreds of uh, of people groups and, and hundreds of languages spoken. We didn't have any idea what that was all about at that particular time. But James Furr headed up that project. That's where Josh Ellis uh, became a part of our association. He started working on that project as a volunteer. By the way, if you want to get a job working for UBA, just come as a volunteer. And if you're really good, we'll find a way to pay you someday. That's how several folks on our staff have gotten jobs. Well, we began to learn about our city, and the more we did, 
And the more we leaned into this, the more we realized we needed to change the way we framed things. And so we began to say, now we exist to mobilize churches to take on lostness. And that's the phrase you've heard us use for the last couple of years. We mobilize churches to take on lostness. But what does that mean? How do you mobilize churches? And, and it, again, how do we take on lostness? And, and it seemed that the easy thing to do was, let's just try and do what we've been doing, only let's do it better and let's do it more aggressively. Let's go back to all the old programs and let's just keep doing it. But we realize, you know, the world has changed. We don't live in 1950. We don't live in 1960. Just because it worked then doesn't mean it works now. And our, our city has changed. So we went back to the scriptures and we began to look at the life of Christ. And I began an, an intense study of reading through the Gospels and the book of Acts and the New Testament. And I'm doing it again this year, reading six times through. If you read about, you know, five chapters a day, something like that, you can get through the New Testament, uh, you know, really, really quickly. And so, you know, that's what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm reading the New Testament multiple times all year long, really focusing in on the Gospels and, and, and looking at the book of Acts. And as we went back to the life of Jesus, I realized there were some things in the way Jesus did things that we needed to learn and incorporate even more. I learned about how Jesus reached people. And I realized it really was tied up with three things. It really begins with presence. Go back to the book of John and it says, in the beginning was the word. And then in verse 14, it says the word, be what? Became flesh. The word became flesh. I love the way some of the modern translations put it. They, they say he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent. Tabernacle is the, the, the Greek word. He pitched his tent just as the tabernacle went with the people of God wherever they went. He's saying, you know, Jesus is, is here. I, I like the message. It says he moved into the neighborhood. I understand that. Jesus moved into the neighborhood. And basically what it's saying to us is if we really want to get serious about mobilizing people for lostness, we've got to do it the way Jesus did it. And one of the ways Jesus did it was he moved into the neighborhood. And then it says, following uh, his temptation experience, uh, his affirmation of calling, he began to preach. And he preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But if you, if you read through the Gospels, and, and it really helps if you read through it quickly, and read through it repeatedly, what you discover is there is, you know, Baptists, we're really into this preaching the gospel part. I mean, we are people of the book and we are people who preach and we are people who teach. That's what we're known for. But as I read it over and over and over again, what I realized was Jesus linked his presence and his proclamation with service. That was, the, that was the, the link that tied these two pieces together. And so you read through, and it, it does say he preached, but then through the Gospels, the emphasis moves away from his preaching to his ministry, to what he did to people. And so we find a summary statement in the book of Acts. Jesus went about doing good. When Jesus was asked by John the baptizer, you know, John's in prison and John is, is, is having second thoughts and, and maybe dealing with doubt. You know, he, he's, he's struggling. He wants to know, did my life really matter? Did I do the right thing when I pointed people to Jesus? And so he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, ask him, are you really the one? And Jesus' response was really clear. You go back and tell them what you have seen and heard. But what he said before that was, you go back and you tell them, the lame walk, the blind see, the dead hear, the sick have been healed. You go back and you tell them what you've seen and what you've heard. It's like the, 
The doing is what makes the proclamation valid. And so as Jesus' brother was struggling with this, you know, after the death of Christ, after the resurrection, after the ascension, James is, is pastoring there in Jerusalem and he's struggling with this and this whole thing of faith and works. And he basically says, I will show you my faith by and through my deeds. You know, that's a powerful, powerful statement. That we can't divorce these two. The more we thought about that, the more our leadership team struggled with that, the more we looked at it, the more we realized if we're going to mobilize churches to take on lostness, it can't just be about the kinds of programs that we've done traditionally for years. It can't be just about the proclamation. It's got to be about the service because that's the thing that ties it all together. Now, all of that is kind of preamble that brings us up to what I've talked about the last couple of meetings, and that's loving Houston. As we look ahead, you know, th this, is, this is an anniversary month for me. Ten years ago, I was in London, and, and, and I just had to tell that story because that story really has been the foundation for everything that's gone on these last ten years. And I went back and I got on the telephone and I spent time uh, over the last week calling one by one the people that were there that were in charge and leaders of that event to just say thank you. I want you to know how much that event changed my life. But I need to also tell you, not only did it change my life, but the work that we've been doing in Houston gives me a platform to where I've had an opportunity to speak all across the country about what's going on here. And it's having an impact and change of lives all across the country. And the way other associations are doing this. I even had one state convention call and say, Tom, can we use the phrase mobilizing churches to take on lostness? as a state convention. <laughs> sure. You know. Well, as we look to loving Houston now, what we're trying to do is, one, we're trying to mobilize churches to take on losses. Two, we're trying to do it the way Jesus did it. And we're trying to tie together the idea of proclamation and service. Not an either or, but a both and. And so, we're calling it loving Houston. And last time I said, pray for us, because I'm going to meet with the mayor, and we're, we're going to ask the mayor, what can we do to bless the city? And uh, that meeting took place uh, back in December. There were a group of us that went and met with Mayor Anise Parker in, in her office. And as uh, we met with her, and as I began to tell her what it was in our heart to do, I began to see this transition from sitting back in her chair, just kind of listening, to moving forward to the front of her chair, kind of leaning into the conversation, saying, really, this is what you all want to do? And then when I, I told her, yeah, we're going to call it Loving Houston, she just smiled and said, really? You're calling it Loving Houston? That's great. And she was overwhelmed that we would try and mobilize folks to do things that would bless the city using her agenda. And so before the day was out, she had already arranged for us to have a comeback meeting to meet with the senior leadership team uh, of the city of Houston to say, okay, you help us understand the projects. You tell us what needs to be done and we'll mobilize our folks to do it. You see, one thing we've learned, and that is that churches have, or cities have things that they really care about. And these people at City Hall, they really care about this city. They love this city. And they want to see our people cared for and provided for and protected. They want to see us have good environment, good schools, good parks. They care about us. Now, what they don't care about is being reached with the gospel of Christ. We care about that. But you know, the place where we connect is we've got people that can help do some of the things that they care about. And they're willing to tell us what it is they'd like done. And we're willing to get our folks out there doing it. And in the process, we're building goodwill that allows us also wonderful opportunities to build relationships. Back to the relational evangelism stuff uh, Jerry was talking about. To build the relationships, to be able to go out then and also share the good news.
So it's good deeds that earn goodwill that also give us a chance to share the good news. So Loving Houston is built on that. And if you go to our website, uh, we're going to be setting up a a special website. You can go uh, eventually to lovinghouston.net. And if you go to lovinghouston.net and you speak English, you click where there are words there that you understand. Click here. And if you speak Spanish and you uh, understand presione aquí, then you presione right there. And it will take you to a dedicated Spanish language website. So everything's going to be in parallel websites, English and Spanish. And that doesn't cover everybody in Houston, but that covers about 90-something percent of us. And if you go to our website, what you'll be able to see, uh, and, and again, eventually, you know, all of this, right now, it's, it's still being developed. It's almost there. It'll soon be up. But you'll be able to go there, and uh, you'll see a home page that talks about what we want to accomplish and why we're doing it. Uh, if that looks like Latin to you, there's, there's, you know, it, it's because this is, this is the template. This is what we're building, you know. But you click on prayer, for example, and you'll be able to go there and you'll be able to download prayer guides. Uh, we've got a, a 28-day prayer guide already. It's in English and Spanish and uh, Chinese. Uh, thanks to Jason Lee. And if you want it in Vietnamese or you want it in Korean, you just let us know. You'll, we'll give it to you. And you have it translated and we'll put it on the web. Folks can download it and use it that way. But you can pray for our city. You can use it in your church. You can use it in your Sunday school class. You, we would encourage you during the month of March to lead your entire church through a month of prayer for our city. Uh, Mary Ann Bridgewater is leading our prayer ministry and through her ministry there probably will be other kinds of prayer guides that you'll be able to download. You'll be able to go there and take a virtual prayer walk of key areas of Houston where we'll be ministering. Uh, We hope to set up a prayer bulletin board where you can list prayer needs. And we mention prayer first because that really has to be the foundation of everything that we do. You know, if, if we're not building it on and around that, we're making a big mistake. So that's the first thing you click to. Then projects. I mean, these are the things we're negotiating with the city of Houston to do. We will be going back. Mike Kraxberger and I will be going tomorrow afternoon. We'll be meeting with the city of Houston leadership team again. Uh, they've given us some areas of the city, and now we're d- getting down to, to projects. And you'll be able to go here and click on uh, projects. It'll take you to another page, and you can see all the areas of the city. Uh, these are some of the areas that we're currently uh, looking at. Uh, if you see the map of Houston, you see... Kind of that inner circle is the 610 loop. The outer circle, uh, pretty well apparent, is Beltway 8. The city of Houston has said there are several areas where uh, critical, critical work needs to be done in these communities. And so uh, just north of where we are right now, there's Acres Homes and uh, kind of northeast, Independence Heights, the Fifth Ward, Denver Harbor, uh, Sunnyside. These were the areas identified by the city. We are already partnering with folks in the third ward, uh, like Generation One and Agape Development. And right now, what we're doing is we are looking at these areas. We'll narrow the list down. Oh, thank you, Elmo. We'll narrow the list down and uh, prioritize it. And then we'll begin to say, okay, here's all the things in this particular area of the city. And we'll start working. And folks will sign up for projects. And we want to encourage you to get your church to sign up. It can be a, a, children, uh, children, a youth group, uh, a Baptist men's group, a uh, women's ministry team. Uh, you could undertake any of a dozen different kinds of projects that we'll be doing, everything uh, from uh, probably uh, some building projects, construction projects, renovation projects, uh, cleanup projects, all sorts of things. The city's setting the priority. We want to do what they want done. And then you'll be able to choose what it is that you want to do. We're also going to work with the community leaders in these areas. That's why we've got to narrow it down. We want to get on the church level and the community level and say, also, you tell us what needs to be done. This is a tremendous undertaking. It's the largest undertaking in the history of Union Baptist Association. 
And Mike Kraxberger is our project uh, manager for this. And believe me, this would not take place without him. And I am so grateful to Mike for all the work that he's doing. So we're going to be looking at that. And then there'll be an events page uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, give us opportunity to share the gospel. We're going to do things like three-on-three -three basketball tournaments. We're going to have an opportunity not only to have fun, but to share the gospel. And we'll be using folks. And, and so if you, if you still play round ball or you've got folks in your church that do, you can sign up a team for that. Uh, it, it's going to be held at Second Baptist. It's going to be a fantastic, fantastic weekend event. We're going to have a race. It's going to be down by Rice University and the Med Center. Uh, and we're going to use these events also to raise money to help fund some of the projects that we're doing. So we're going to have fun. We're going to fund projects, uh, and we're going to share the gospel. Now, in Houston, we understand the idea of launching, right? You know, this is Space City. So we're going to have a launch event, and that launch event is going to be the last weekend in February. And... In that particular launch event, we're going we're gonna to do two primary things. One, we're going to have a worship service. And that worship service is going to be on Sunday night, 7 to 9. And it's going to be at Second Baptist. And i got to tell you, that scares me to death. Uh, because for one thing, that's a humongous place. It'll hold 6,000 folks. And, you know, 75 people are going to look awful puny out there. And so we need you all as church leaders to go back and to help get your folks out. Very, very, very few of our churches even have Sunday night service anymore. So you can, you're, you're not asking them to give up your church service. You know, you're getting them there for an event that's going to cast vision for reaching the whole city and just kind of outline everything that we're trying to do. It's going to be a, a worship celebration. There's going to be recognitions and awards. Uh, it's, it, it's going to be multifaceted and multicultural. It's going to be a real, real challenging event. Uh, Kevin Izell, who's uh, a friend and also the president of the North American Mission Board, Kevin is coming in. He's going to be speaking to, uh, to us that evening. It's going to be a great, great event. But we're going to, on the front end and back of that, we're going to do training, and the training is going to be related to the things that we'll be doing uh, uh, in June. Now, on the front end, in Spanish, I didn't put it up there because it's going to be in Spanish. On the front end, on Saturday, there will be a training uh, at Second Baptist in Spanish, uh, and it will deal with issues that relate to the Hispanic community and the things that they're dealing with in trying to reach other Hispanics with the gospel of Christ. And if you speak Spanish, Ron, you're welcome to come. Any others that speak Spanish, glad to have you there to be a part of that. It'll be from 8.30 in the morning till 12.30 in the afternoon. There may be some other training that will go along as a part of that, but that's all we've got officially confirmed right now. Uh, then on Monday, the worship service on Sunday night, then on Monday, uh, we've got a day-long training event uh, Featuring first, uh, Dr. Alvin Reed. Dr. Reed used to be here. He was the uh, John Bassanio Chair of Evangelism at Houston Baptist University. He's now at uh, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, chair, uh, Professor of Evangelism. And he has, he has understood the changing environment that we live in as well as anyone and how to communicate the gospel in that environment. And so it's about learning how to share the story with people of all backgrounds and face, and be able to really engage them in spiritual conversation. And so he's going to talk about how to tell the story. And we're giving him the morning to that. This is that good. We're giving him the morning to it. And then we'll have lunch together. And then the afternoon, we're going to have three different tracks. One is for the more traditional uh, church model. Uh, and it's basically around mobilizing your church and some things that Churches need one around relational evangelism, four by four, uh, developed by one of our pastors here in Houston, Greg Wallace. Uh, Mary Ann Bridgewater is going to lead a seminar on prayer strategies uh, for your church and reaching the lost. Don Waybright, one of our ministers of missions, is going to lead one on identifying the uniqueness of your church and 
building on the church's uniqueness. It's not about a program. It's about building on the strengths and uniquenesses of your church to develop ministries for reaching in the community. They've done a fantastic job in Third Ward and other places. So Don will be leading that. Another track is going to be about the people that we're going to encounter when we're out there sharing the gospel with them. One is that now probably the largest group of folks in the U.S. They're called the nuns, those people who had no religious identity whatsoever. And Dr. Reed's going to follow up his morning presentation and he's going to lead that. Uh, and then uh, Brian Lee, uh, one of our pastors, uh, is going to talk about what are some of the things that we need to know if we encounter a Muslim. Now, this is not a a study in Islam, but it's just, you know, these are hour-long presentations. So it's basically going to be just down and dirty. These are things you really need to know if you encounter someone who is Muslim while you're out there working in some of these projects. Uh, so uh, Brian, who is himself a former Muslim, is going to be talking about doing that. And then Keith Carmichael, Minister of uh, Evangelism and the pastor of the West Campus for Second Baptist Church is going to talk about what about those who've left the church? What about those who have had that negative experience, grew up in the church as a child, but they left? These are some of the hardest folks because they've been inoculated. And so he's going to talk about how do we reach those. And then there's going to be a third track and it's going to be built on this whole service model. Uh, Dr. Al Gilbert, who is, I think, very soon going to be the vice president of evangelism for the North American Mission Board. Al had a tremendous change of heart when he was a pastor. He was a pastor of a leading church in North Carolina. They were doing fantastic stuff all around the world. They were leading missions and mission trips all around the world. A reporter came and interviewed him one day and said, you know, if you ever did anything in the city like you're doing around the world, that would be news. And it so hit him that he, he got his attention that he began to rethink everything he was doing. And he began to, to change what they were doing. And he's going to tell his church's story. And it's a phenomenal, phenomenal story. And we're going to follow that up with some folks, Brian and Kelly Gowan, who have been working there in the Third Ward. They've been going to the same community over and over. They have been the, the presence of Christ. <laughs> They've almost moved into that community. And the story of how that community has changed is phenomenal. And then... Uh, Kirk Craig is going to come and he's going to talk about it from just one person's perspective. And the focus he's going to take is what not to do. Because so often our, our good deeds are kind of like touchdown landings of an airplane. We kind of land and take off again. And he's going to talk about toxic goodness and how not to do good things but to do it in a way that really empower, it's, empowers them. It's not about us feeling good after we do it. It's about us leaving a transformed people and community behind when we leave. And he's going to talk about that perspective. Now, here's what I know. I want to attend all of those. But you can't. Now, what you can do is you can go to one at one and another at two, another at three. You can stay in one track. You can mix them up. But we're going to see if we can't videotape all of these and put all of these ultimately available online for you. So we're going to have this launch event. It's the last weekend in February. So the Super Bowl is over. All the awards ceremonies of movies television all that stuff's pretty well behind us you know so there's nothing to do the last weekend in february so we want you to come the last week in february saturday training in spanish sunday night worship service i would love to see the parking lot overflowing at second baptist church Believe me, we've never had anything like this. So this kind of event is, is, is risky and novel, but I think it's going to be great. And then the training all day Monday, and then that will prepare us for a week of service to the city, June 1 through 8. Now, Southern Baptist will be coming to town in June, and their volunteers will be coming, and they'll be working with us, and they're going to call it Crossover, and we're going to call it Loving Houston, but we're going to be working side by side. And then we're going to extend it on beyond. And I believe God's going to do a great, great thing. But he's not going to do it just because we're good folks. You know, we were 
and staff development uh, toward the end of December. And, and we were doing some stuff in the downtown area, taking a, a, a Segway tour of the city, and, and we did a prayer walk of the city, and, and uh, we were leaving, and as we were leaving, Ginger Smith said, hey, let me take you by such and such a place. I want you to see something. She took us out to see something, and it wasn't that. But we saw that, and Diane said, take a picture of that. So, you know, good old iPhone. You know, pull out your iPhone, stick it out the window, take a picture of that. And somehow that's going to become iconic for us. It is that we do love Houston. We really do. And we love the Lord. And we want to see Houston and the people of our city come to know our Lord and become fully devoted followers of Christ.